committee will come back to order. I hope uh, in this recess period we've had an opportunity to clarify getting amendments in order so we can consider them. I understand that all amendments that have been submitted before the recess are, are ready uh, to uh, be offered. So we've got a lot of work and a lot of work, a lot of amendments uh, ready for us to work on. Let me now. Uh, do, you, do you have some of the onion? Here's amendments that have Republican amendments that are okay. ready for Title I. Okay. I think Mr. Rogers is ready to go. Well, he's. And I think he's at number. He's Mr. Rogers, you have an amendment. Could you give us the number on that amendment? Mr. Chairman, it's 601. Six. Is it the one that still laws? Because that was one. The uh, gentleman is recognized to offer his amendment. You have an amendment at the desk, Mr. Rogers. The clerk will report the amendment. It's, um, yeah. You want to identify? I apologize, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> His name was not on the amendment. We know where it is. Hang on one second. Would you report the amendment? Yes, sir. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute offered by Mr. Rogers. After second, With, Without ob objection, the, the amendment will be considered as read, and the gentleman from Michigan is recognized to uh, explain his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I think this is incredibly important as uh, we move forward. I think we can all agree that, that clean, sustainable uh, and energy policy that reduces our dependence on foreign oil is all important and something that we can all agree on. I think how we get there is incredibly uh, important and we have some very serious differences. One thing that we know when, by reading this bill. Could you suspend? Because we still don't. Yeah, we still I mean, don't have the amendment it, distributed. We need to let the members have it. I will assist. I will we don't have our computers handy for the <laughs> PDF. I don't understand. We should and must have a distribution of the amendment. That's true. It's the law. Sure. 
Mr. Chairman. Who's seeking recognition? Uh, Mr. Shemkus from Illinois. To, uh, Shemkus, for this, what purpose do you wish to be recognized? Okay, I think they found the amendment. I was going to suggest we just read the amendment while they're looking, and that would expedite the process. Well, we've already waived the reading, but I did want members to have it in front of them. And uh, that is now being passed out. So we'll start all over again, and I yield uh, five minutes to the uh, gentleman from Michigan. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. As I, I said earlier, this is uh, incredibly important that we get this right, and we can all agree that clean, sustainable uh, energy uh, and an energy plan that reduces our dependency on foreign oil is incredibly important. But here's what we know that this bill, as sits before us, will do. It will increase the average consumer's electricity rates. It will. Matter of fact, there's provisions in the bill to try to figure out how they help the poorest of the poor pay for it. Even though it's not very, if, if you read it, it's very complicated and good luck in ever getting your money. The second thing it will do is increase unemployment. It's in the bill. They actually have a whole section dedicated to set up a whole different fund separate from unemployment insurance to try to pay people as long as 52 weeks for losing their jobs because of the passage of cap and trade in the bill. That's, both of those things are in the bill. And you know, Michigan, we're awful proud. We think we help create the middle class with manufacturing and the automobile business. And nobody's feeling the pinch of this as our families in Michigan uh, with all of the pressures now on manufacturing and the ability for them to compete in a worldwide market. So you're going to increase their ability to cost of energy. That's definitely going up. You're going to decrease their ability to compete, and their unemployment is going up. And here's the, here's the, the, the most frustrating part of it. There are two nations who have been absolutely pursuing manufacturing increases in their own countries at a rabid pace, both China and India. And they won't sign on to anything of the sort because they've got millions and millions of people to employ. They've already started weighing in on stealing our manufacturing jobs. And guess what? They're going to do it some more. Just give me a, a, a second on these numbers. China now leads the world in greenhouse gas emissions. As our manufacturing was going down, as our intensity of cleaning the air was going up, by the way, uh, they have been seeking uh, coal plants and nuclear plants and they are absolutely pursuing our manufacturing base. They want to build stuff in China because they know that means the middle class is working. India's carbon emissions are rising faster than nearly every other nation on the planet, according to the EIA. Between 1980 and 2006, the country's carbon output increased by 341 percent. That's a greater rate of increase than that of China, 312 percent, Brazil, 103 percent, Indonesia, 238 percent, and Pakistan, 272 percent. And in the same time period, imagine the growth that we had between 1980 and 2006 in our manufacturing sector. We just went up 23 percent. Why? Because we employ a lot more people, but through intensity of cleaning emissions, we were winning that game. So we had a way to clean our air, to clean our environment, and employ people. At the end of the day, if we have to invoke half of the sections in this bill, I don't know how you pay for it. They even create a separate section for job losses in the public sector. So does that mean if a police officer loses his job because the factory in the town closed and that they can't afford the, the tax base revenue anymore and they have to lay off firefighters and police officers, we all have to pitch in and pay for that too? According to this, yes. And according to this bill, they know it's coming. That's why they created a separate section for public employees who lose their jobs because of cap and trade. The darndest thing is that Europe tried this and it's not working very well. We actually beat them in intensity in the same time period they had a cap and trade uh, regime. So there is a better way to get to clean air. But the least we ought to do in the face of putting the pressure we have on, on working families in my state, in my district, and all around this country is say we're at least going to give you a fight and chance. We shouldn't just wholesale allow China and India to steal our manufacturing base and steal your job and your future and rob us of a middle class because they want one awful bad. That's why they won't sign on to this. This bill is very simple. It says that China and India, if they don't sign on by the, the time this act is implemented, that this act is delayed. It is a competitive issue. Do not do not eliminate our middle class and send it to China and India. That's what this bill will do. 
My amendment says, wait up. If you want to try this, at least let's have a level playing field. And China and India, who we know are having these emission increases and actively pursuing our manufacturing base, should be on the same level. Don't disadvantage the people who get up every day and pay by, play by the rules, who are already struggling to make their house payments, who are already struggling to make their electric, electric bill payments. One in five families in America today are behind over 30 days in their electric bill. One in five. One in three in Michigan. You pass this bill, I can't tell you how high that's going to be. You're going to have to pay for every firefighter, every teacher, every private sector person who's lost their job because of this, because we cannot compete in the nation, in the world anymore. And I would urge the adoption of this amendment. The gentleman's uh, time has expired. Any uh, one seek recognition, Mr. Markey? Th thank you, Mr. Chairman. In opposition to the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Chairman, um, there is no doubt that ultimately we do have to bring all of the world's emitters, including countries like China and India, uh, into a worldwide framework for reducing greenhouse gases uh, uh, and the impact that they have upon uh, the planet. Uh, Todd Stern, the President's uh, able envoy, is already in the process of beginning those discussions with China and with uh, India. Uh, but uh, most of us recognize that unless the United States and Europe, which are, have been historically the world's largest emitters, uh, and since CO2 is cumulative up there, um, that we have to show leadership. China, without question, is now uh, an emitter at a world-class level. Uh, but if we want to go to Copenhagen with the ability to be able to begin serious negotiations with the Chinese and the Indians, uh, we must demonstrate that we are serious about this issue uh, as well. In the legislation, because of the efforts of Mr. Doyle and Mr. Inslee, there is language which is uh, going to ensure uh, that we protect the trade-sensitive, energy-intensive industries like steel and aluminum and paper and other trade-sensitive industries so that we build a transition. And we've worked very hard with each one of those sectors in order to make sure that that protection is there. Similarly, uh, we also um, uh, are going to have this bill referred to the Ways and Means Committee. We do not have uh, jurisdiction uh, over uh, tariffs. However, it is our intention uh, and uh, the Ways and Means Committee's intention uh, to devise a tariff schedule uh, uh, in, at the point at which um, the uh, allocation for the protection of these trade sensitive uh, industries is uh, beginning to phase out so that countries, and we'll say for the, uh, for the purpose of this discussion that they might be India and China, uh, are trying to take advantage of our industries because of our compliance and their noncompliance that an appropriate tariff can be uh, established in order to ensure uh, that those countries are properly uh, paradoxed uh, and uh, policed. Uh, and so uh, the choice that we have is not whether or not we anticipate that. We do in this legislation. The question is whether or not, having anticipated it, um, we now stop and not try to take advantage of this huge economic opportunity. What we also know is that China is now the largest exporter of solar technology in the world. They're targeting this sector. Uh, Germany, uh, Germany's uh, uh, second largest export after automobiles is now wind. Uh, turbines. So this, this is a huge sector that could mean three to five million jobs for the American economy. And what we have done in the legislation is create a transition, create a bridge, also ensure that at the end uh, that uh, countries that do not comply are not going to take advantage of our industry. But meanwhile, we will be capturing this incredible opportunity uh, to uh, create this new manufacturing sector for our economy. And I would reject this amendment. Would, would the gentleman uh, because, yield the question? Uh, because it basically 
uh, would uh, make it impossible for us uh, to move forward with the kind of aggressiveness that we need to in order to capture this uh, great uh, uh, technological uh, opportunity which our country should be the leader on. Would, would the Mr. gentleman Chairman? yield for a question? I will be glad to yield. Uh, hearing your uh, opposition to this amendment, would you uh, accept the amendment if we put a, uh, uh, maybe a five-year so uh, uh, that they had to certify that within five years they would have uh, from date of enactment that they would agree to a similar standard? We have carefully constructed here in the legislation a set of protections for our industries uh, that these uh, industries have embraced as a good formula. And they also understand uh, that there will be a tariff that will also be imposed uh, in the event of a violation. So we intend on going forward for countries that are not going to comply, we will have a system in place that does not allow them to take advantage of the fact that they are not in compliance. So, um, so the, uh, the, it, there's no need for us to pull out because we would be pulling out of a technological revolution. It is that we will make sure that other countries do not exploit the fact uh, that we are moving forward. And this formula that we have in the legislation makes that possible. Mr. Chairman. The gentleman's time has expired. Who seeks recognition? Mr. Blunt. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I, I'm supportive of the amendment and actually more supportive after the subcommittee chairman made his comments. I mean, he made the point that discussions are underway. That sounds like a good thing. So if discussions are underway and whoever's having those discussions is as capable as Mr. Markey suggested they were, uh, maybe they produce result and this, this, uh, this problem is solved. He also made the point uh, that CO2 is, uh, is uh, cumulative in the atmosphere. So if what you do is you take a job from uh, our country where we do regulate uh, utilities in a significant way and send it to any other country that has less of a regulation than we do, particularly the two countries Mr. Rogers mentions in his amendment, uh, you actually increase the amount of CO2 going into the air. Uh, yeah, the, 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 Mr. Markey mentioned that uh, uh, China is leading in producing solar technology and solar equipment. I would suggest that they are producing that equipment in factories that have very little, if any, concern about what goes into the environment out of that factory. Uh, you know, the net gain of the solar equipment they produce may actually not be there at all because of what they are putting in the atmosphere to, uh, uh, to uh, produce that very equipment. So if, if all you do is send jobs out of this country into any country that has less of a current standard than we do, you are actually making the problem greater, not smaller. This bill actually has a negative impact in, in the amount of CO2 going into the atmosphere, not a positive impact. Uh, and you know, and, and if, if CO2 is bad, it is just as bad coming from China, India or anywhere else as it is from here, and then I hear the discussions. Well, we're going to we're going to solve this with protections and tariffs. In in a recessionary environment, uh, there is there's no economist that I'm aware of that doesn't believe that th that's the very language that extended the depression in the 30s. Was we took we did all the wrong things. We went into a protectionist tariff oriented economy. Uh, and it, it uh, took years to emerge from that economy. A and then, you know, even if tariffs would, would uh, uh, do some offsetting of the jobs that we lost here by raising prices for what people buy here, prices go up then for what people buy here. And what is the tariff impact in our country on the global marketplace? Uh, so the Chinese or the Indians produce something a lot cheaper because they are less concerned about what, how their utilities are produced. Uh, and uh, then we have a tariff on that product coming into this country, which makes it harder for us to buy, but it doesn't make it harder for anybody else in the world to buy. Uh, and their position in the global marketplace is enhanced. Our, our, our consumers pay more. I'm trying to figure out what American family benefits uh, from that situation. Uh, more, more CO2 in the air, higher prices for Americans, and lower prices for our competitors in a global economy. That is why Mr. Rogers' amendment uh, makes so much sense. Uh, and uh, if these discussions are underway and they are going to produce a result, fine. The amendment would have no impact. If they don't produce a result, 
the failure to have an amendment like this uh, does all of the wrong things uh, and doesn't do any of the right things in, in, in terms of dealing with this problem. If it's a global atmospheric problem, it's a global atmospheric solution. Uh, and the, the, the ways that we are supposedly uh, protecting America's environment are offset by the very things that Mr. Rogers tries to prevent uh, in his amendment, and I support it. Gentlemen, uh, yield to me for a question? I, I would. I, I don't understand that argument that you've made that we'll have more carbon emissions uh, if, if this amendment were adopted. If we could, I try to explain it. Yes, uh, please do. If if uh, a, an American company uh, like the aluminum company in southeast Missouri that has said if this if the original bill passed they would have to leave the country, if they go to a country that has less of a standard than we currently have on pollutants of all kinds, then they're producing their product in a country with less standards than we have today. That sends more pollutants into the environment. Not only is it we lose the jobs, but we actually lose the effort uh, to try to make the environment more secure from these things that some people feel strongly are having an impact. And that's, that's what I mean by that. And uh, I uh, would yield back my two seconds, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman's time has expired. The Chair will recognize himself. Your, your argument seems to be that uh, companies will move to China because there are lower environmental requirements. What Mr. Markey explained is that there is no reason for them to have to move. They could stay here and still be competitive, even if a company in China or India didn't meet the same standards that we had, because uh, we, would, we would help our, con our companies that are sensitive to trade be able to continue in business and stay viable. Uh, we do that under the, uh, uh, under the well, amendment. Will the chairman uh, yield? No, no, I'm, I'm still talking. Uh, we do that un under the amendment that uh, uh, we've adopted to provide uh, benefit to, the, um, to those industries that would otherwise be at a, com a competitive disadvantage. And we suspect that they uh, expect that the Ways and Means Committee will give a, a, uh, another opportunity to, to keep our people uh, viable in competition with other companies. So we don't have to have people from America leave. But it's what bothers me about this amendment is that we're going to let some other country decide our fate. We, we want our fate to be decided by Americans. We want to, to be able to uh, have our nation develop all the industries that are going to be developed and all the jobs that are going to be developed as we move to a uh, cleaner uh, energy policy. We want America not to be beholden to foreign countries from whom we have to import uh, oil. And that's the purpose of the whole bill. More jobs, more independence. And we believe it will give us an opportunity to go to Copenhagen and lead and get other countries to follow us. But to say that if China or India doesn't do what, exactly what we do, we're not going to do anything either, puts us where we've been for the last eight years. I don't think that's been a great success, either on making us l less dependent on importing oil or more advanced in technology. The status quo is helping others beat us because we're not putting the effort into developing the technology here at home to allow Americans to decide our energy fate. So uh, this is about investing, building, and selling the technologies of the future. We need this bill for our own economic security. And we shouldn't say we're going to shoot ourselves in the head because China or India is not doing what we want them to do. We're just punishing ourselves. So I, I, uh, I would Will the gentleman urge, yield? I would urge opposition. Gentleman Who's yield? asking me to yield? Yes, Mr. Shattuck. Uh, just uh, two points to add uh, uh, to Mr. the point Mr. Blunt made. Uh, it is certainly the belief of many of the members on this side to try to clarify Mr. Blunt's point that many plants here in the United States are more efficient, more modern, and will produce less carbon dioxide on their own, including uh, any plant in the United States versus a plant even in Mexico. And so that uh, if you sh move a plant out of the United States, you move it to Mexico or China or elsewhere, you will actually produce more carbon dioxide. The second point I want well, to make I, 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 let me Let me stop and reclaim my time on that point. I don't believe that will be the case. 
I don't think there'll be a reason why they'll want to take advantage of uh, lower standards in uh, China or India for an American company. I, I think I the point yield, I wanted to make. I want to excuse me, it's my time. I want to yield to Mr. Doyle because this was the concern he very much raised and was the source of the uh, reason for the amendment that's incorporated in this bill. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and uh, th this is something that concerned many of us uh, on, on the committee greatly. Uh, I come from Pittsburgh. Uh, uh, U.S. Steel is, is headquartered there. Alcoa, uh, one of the largest aluminum companies in the world, headquartered in, in Pittsburgh. Uh, uh, to take the example that Mr. Blunt has, we have looked at these carbon intensive industries that have global competition and said, what can we do? to level the playing field when their competitors aren't in a climate change regime. Uh, we have addressed this specifically in the bill. We have set aside 15 percent of the allocation to these carbon intensive industries that have trade, trade sensitive uh, concerns and said uh, we are going to give an output based rebate. What we are doing uh, in, this, in this bill is, is we are looking at the industry sector average, how much carbon does an industry put in the air, let's take steel for instance, when they make a ton of steel. And what we're saying to U.S. steel companies is if you're at the average or better, you're going to get 100 percent of all your emission costs in this bill rebated to your company starting in 2014 when the caps go in and extending all the way to 2025. Mr. Doyle, I yes. just want to ask you one question before my time runs out. If we didn't have this bill, are, are steel and the other industries uh, doing well? seems to me they're running, they're running into a difficult situation right now in competition. And uh, this legislation will allow them to compete and we can accomplish the goals uh, that we're trying to this achieve. This is going to allow us to continue to make cleaner steel in the United States of America and level the playing field with their competitors in China and India. Thank you. My time has expired. Who seeks recognition? Mr. Barton. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I rise in support of the uh, Rogers Amendment. I want to try to uh, reply to some of the things that Mr. Markey and yourself and Mr. Doyle have just said. Let me simply say to Mr. Doyle, don't doubt your good faith. I know how hard you're trying to protect the U.S. steel manufacturing capability, and you have been able to apparently negotiate some, some offsets and some, some allowances for certain periods of time. Uh, as I understand it, though, those allowance uh, offsets begin to fade away uh, around the year 2025, and I'm not sure when they totally phase out. Number two, any time you set up a program where you take something away and then you give it back, the government never gives back 100 percent of what it takes away. There's the famous story of the, the family that uh, wanted some money, and they're very religious, so they asked God to send them 100 dollars. Uh, it landed on the Postmaster General's desk here in Washington. He felt very sympathetic, so he sent him a $20 bill. And the wife got it in the mail, and when the husband came home, she said, I've got good news and bad news. God answered our letter, but he sent it through Washington, and those turkeys kept 80 percent of it. It's just not going to work, Mike. And I know you're trying. I also want to point out... Gentlemen, you don't take the post office name in vain. <laughs> well, it's just a fact. But anyway, the... Um, You've got a Title III, which we've never seen before, and I've been trying to read it as we've gone through the markup. But in Title III, you have on page 382 a requirement in Section 705 that beginning in 2013 and every year, every four years thereafter, the Secretary of Energy and perhaps the EPA Administrator have to make a report on compliance with these, these targets on CO2 and other greenhouse gas emissions. Those reports include a review of international actions. And on page 390, if in fact this report says that we're not making progress to meet this standard that's in, in the bill, of no more than 3.6 degree Fahrenheit increase in temperature from 1850 and no more than 450 parts per million of CO2 worldwide, the, the administrator then has to report to the Congress on additional reductions required to meet those goals. And then on page 395, 
the President of the United States under Section 707 has to, has to submit to the Congress a set of recommendations uh, on how to force domestic additional reductions to meet the requirements that are not being met internationally. You're putting in place a mechanism to offset the very thing that Mr. Doyle is trying to put in. Now, all Mr. Rogers is trying to do is say, if we're going to set up this, this mechanism in Title III of all these allowances and we have this descending requirement for anthropogenic greenhouse gas reductions, as Mr. Markey has pointed out, CO2 is CO2, whether it's, whether it's produced in the United States or it's produced in China or India. India is fast approaching the United States in terms of its CO2 emissions. China has already surpassed us. So Mr. Rogers is the Protect American Jobs Now Amendment. He simply says if, if India and China are not doing anything, and I would point out that in China they, they require three times the amount of energy to produce one ton of steel. Mr. Doyle's constituents are much more efficient at producing steel than the Chinese are. But we're going to set up a situation where you, where you, sh you shut down your steel plant in Pittsburgh or in my congressional district at Grapeland, Texas, Jewett, Texas, or Middleothian, Texas, and you move that to China, to Mexico, because they don't have these requirements. And don't kid yourself, they are already c contacting U.S. companies. I have companies in Texas that have already been contacted by international uh, groups and said, move your facility from Texas to X if this bill passes. So Mr. Rogers is simply saying you've got a mechanism in your bill to require reviews and assimilations internationally, so you're going to be collecting the data if that data shows that they're not doing anything to reduce their emissions, then we ought to stop our program here in the United States and keep our jobs here in the United States. This is, this is a very important amendment. It is a good yes amendment. Mr. Chairman. Ms. time has expired. Ms. Eshoo. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, I rise uh, in opposition to the amendment, and let me say why. And I'm glad that I was called on a little later rather than a little earlier, because I've had the advantage of listening to the pros and cons on this. Uh, I think that this amendment, long short, bets on the United States failing. And I don't believe that we are going to fail. I think we are going to win and win big. Uh, and I say that because uh, all of the steps that need to be taken to establish a new manufacturing base in our country and protect the one that we have uh, is, uh, is protected and built upon in the bill. <clears throat> the bill provides for the transition, as other members have said. Uh, I've been, uh, I was in India last year and China the year before. I don't envy them, and neither should any of you. I want to tell you something. Their people are wearing face masks. Their leadership understands that if they don't get their arms around the issue of what can kill people and also kill off their future in terms of opportunities, that they have to change. What has been missing in all of this is the essential leadership of the United States of America. We are a country that counts in every corner of the world. And so this legislation leapfrogs us into a position of leadership in the world. So if others choose to fail, then we should take the off-ramp that says on the sign, Failure Avenue? I don't think so. I think that, uh, as I do very often, that we should be first in technology. We should be first in biotechnology. We should be first in human rights. We should be first in all of these categories. That's what this bill establishes. It moves the United States of America into the number one position. And as we do, we create opportunities for our people across the country. And most importantly, it takes into consideration 
the various problems that regions of our country do legitimately have and offers in a specific title how to transition in order to, uh, to get uh, uh, those regions and the people that live there and work there able to take advantage of what uh, we are preparing at this table. So uh, I don't want to take this amendment that says, you know what, if the others fail, then let's follow their leadership of failure. That's what it is. And uh, A, we're not going to fail at this. Uh, this is going to be a boon for the United States of America uh, in the 21st century, but other countries are going to follow because they're going to understand that they don't want to miss out on the gold that's in the green. I yield back. The gentlelady yields back her time. Uh, gentleman from Michigan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just, you know, as I came back from Michigan yesterday, every one of my counties is double digit unemployment, every single one of them. And things are not looking better. There was a report that I saw two weeks ago that it talked about some areas of southeast Michigan and those three counties over here have more people, or used to anyway, than the other 80 counties uh, combined in Michigan. And there was a report that came out that, in fact, by the year, by the end of next year, we might see unemployment as high as 24 or 25 percent because of the auto industry. DTE, my, one of my uh, largest utilities in Michigan, already has one in three customers in arrears. They think that they're going to lose as much as four to five hundred million dollars in uncollected bills. And right now there's a new crime in southeast Michigan. It's called stealing power. People actually going out and changing the meters so that they don't have to be billed what they really pay or what they really use. So jobs is the issue. And the last thing that my state needs or any other state, particularly in the Midwest, and I been down with uh, President Obama down to Elkhart, which has the highest unemployment rate in the country, almost 20 percent. Talked to my colleagues, our colleague Steve, uh, uh, Mark Souter this last week. I think they lost 7,000 jobs just last week. What congressional district can afford to lose those? And for a lot of these industries, where are they going? They're going overseas or someplace else. And the last thing that we can do is to tell our businesses that go. Because your costs are going to be less, go. And we lose those jobs forever. Now, it just happens to be that when you look at steel, and I give credit to our steel industry. They've done marvelous things. And again, my district's in southwest Michigan, so as I go to Chicago, go through Gary, the former steel capital of the world, Pittsburgh, I've been to Pittsburgh, I've, I've seen the advances that we've made in technology. It's great. And you know what? Today, this country, we emit one-third less carbon per ton of steel than China does because we've made those investments. And so what those industries will do, and I like what Mr. Doyle what Mr. Doyle's done, but I don't know that it's a complete failsafe. And that's why this amendment does. This amendment provides the insurance that, in fact, China and India are going to come on board. And I happen to know that some of the members of this committee, I think, are going on a Codell next week to China. I think it's, I think it's led by the Speaker. And what argument would be greater for that bipartisan Codell, especially if Mr. Sensenbrenner is along with it, that you know what, Congress just, or the House Committee just passed this bill, and by golly, you guys have got to be on board. Whether it's by the time that the bill is enacted or, or a suggestion that I had to Mr. Markey that maybe it's within five years, but damn it, you're going to be on board. And if you're not, you're not going to see those jobs leak again from this country. I've watched that picture from Mr. Shimkus uh, that he's put up this entire last couple of months. We almost know the names of those 14,000 workers that lost their job when the Clean Air Act passed. They said then, too, we're not going to have any job leaks. Well, guess what? They're gone. China is now the largest emitter that there is on the planet, and India is coming pretty close. 
And if we don't demand that they have the same type of criteria that we do environmentally, we're just going to see these jobs go and go and go. So this is a good amendment. If somehow it fails, I'd like to think that we'll come back and just give a time frame so that we can put a gun to China's head and say, you're going to comply, period. It will be an incentive for you to comply. We've heard from some delegations that have gone to speak to our Chinese counterparts, oh, of course they're going to comply. They can't even find hundreds of miles of the Great Wall. They just discovered 180 miles of it uh, this last month that they didn't know was there for 2,000 years. They're putting on a new coal plant every single week. It's about time they comply with the same type of standards that we do because we don't want that carbon escape. We want to know that if we're competitive, they're going to have the same rules as us. And that's why this amendment is a good one, and I hope that it passes, and if it somehow fails, we still ought to have a timeline so that the co congressional delegation, when they go there next week, says, comply or else. Gentlemen, yield to me. Be glad to yield, Mike. Seems to me that what you're saying is that we ought to have a gun to our head, so if China doesn't comply, we fire it. And then we get nothing here, and we've got nothing there. And if we have no requirements here or there, I, it's hard for me to believe that uh, the last eight years have, or, or so have been good for steel and some of these other industries. I think they have relocated to China. At least this legislation will uh, provide some protections for those industries while we take the leadership in trying to develop our own ability to control our energy destiny. Well, if I could just conclude in the remaining time that we share, this provides an additional assurance that, in fact, they might eventually come to the table and, and uh, uh, meet the same standards that we do, and that's why it needs to pass. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, this time has expired. Uh, Mr. Doyle? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, when my grandfather, Mike Doyle, come over from Ireland, uh, he settled in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and he got a job in the steel industry. And he worked 41 years in the Cary Furnace in Rankin. And my father was born, his name was Mike Doyle too. And after he come back from World War II, he got a job in Edgar Thompson Steel Mill, where he worked for 30 years. I spent two summers there, which was enough to convince me I didn't want to work in the steel mill. But in my town where I grew up and have lived all but two years of my life, everyone's dad in that town either worked at Union Switch and Signal or down at Edgar Thompson Steel Mill. If anybody on this committee thinks that I don't care about what happens to jobs and manufacturing in western Pennsylvania, or that for that matter every single member sitting over here on this side of the aisle doesn't care about that, think again, because we do. Job leakage is a very big concern of ours. So we've asked ourselves at the beginning of this, what do we do to make sure that our industries here in the United States have a level playing field against those countries that aren't yet signing on to a climate change regime. And I'd like to take the time that I have to share with the members what we've done in the bill and why I believe that we have protections in this bill to guarantee a level playing field so that the situations that Mr. Barton has described uh, and others over there, that you can at least uh, rest assured that this is a concern of ours and that we take it very seriously. This bill starts by setting aside 15% of the allocations, 15 percent of the allocations for carbon intensive industries that have trade competition. We have a metric for it. We're talking mainly about the steel industry, the aluminum industry, cement, lime, and certain chemicals. If you fit this metric, what we start to do in 2014 when the caps start to take place, uh, we say to these industries, or if you're at average, we're going to rebate you 100 percent of your emission cost, 100%. If you're better than average, we're going to give you 100% plus. This starts at 2014, goes to the year 2025. Now, the total pot of allocation goes down at a rate of 2%, but you consistently get 15% of that total pot of allocation. Now, what happens in the year 2025? Well, one of three things can happen. The president at 2025 can look at the situation and say either we've got international agreements signed now with the Chinese, with the Indians, with others. There's now a level playing field. 
there's no longer need for a program such as this. And if that's the case, the program phases out at a rate of 10 percent a year. So this subsidy, this, this rebate continues after 2025, even if the playing field is level, at a rate of 10 percent. Now, what happens if we haven't got an agreement with China or India, if there's still not a level playing field for our companies? The President can do one or two things. He can continue this 100 percent rebate program. He can continue the program, or at that time he can implement border tariffs, or he can do a combination of the two. So what we've done basically for industries like steel and aluminum and cement that had these pressures that we're concerned about, we are basically holding them harmless for the next 10 years. We're giving our president something to have in his pocket when he goes to Copenhagen and says, America has started down this path. Now it's time for others to start down this path. It's, it's a, a leverage with, company, with countries like China and India to get them started. And if they don't, if they don't, there are still tools in the president's purse after 2025 to continue to protect these industries. I wouldn't vote for a bill if I believed this was going to cause us to lose jobs in the steel industry or the aluminum industry. This bill addresses these concerns in a legitimate fashion. Uh, we are setting aside a huge allotment, 15 percent of the total allotment of this bill is going for these carbon intensive industries. So I, I, I know that you're serious. Uh, I know Mike Rogers. He's a friend of mine. He comes from a state like Michigan, which is a state like mine in western Pennsylvania. We still employ 170,000 people in manufacturing in my state, and we don't well, want to lose a single one of those jobs. Will the gentleman but, yield? And I'll yield in a second. But we address this in the bill. We're serious about it in the bill. And I want our colleagues to know that, that we're just as concerned as you are about the issue of job leakage, and we've made a good faith effort to do that. We've worked with the steel industry, with the Steel Workers Union, with all these industries, all these stakeholders that are at risk, have sat down at the table with us as we've worked on this legislation. Uh, and, and, and I think you all should know that, and, and uh, you can see it in the bill. Yes, Mr. Stearns, I'll yield to you. The gentleman's time has expired. We're going to go to the Republican side. And uh, I don't know who would be next in seniority that seeks recognition. Mr. Stearns, are you seeking recognition? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, strike the last word. Gentleman's recognized for Mr. five Scalise, minutes. Mr. Scalise, I'll yield to, to, to the gentleman from Louisiana. I thank the gentleman from Florida for yield, and I appreciate the, the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Rogers, bringing this amendment because, you know, there's been a lot talked about in terms of all the jobs that will be created. and. You know, we've heard that before in years past, the Clean Air Act. We heard about jobs being created only to see jobs lost. And this bill, as was pointed out earlier, has sections dedicated to the job losses that would occur. There's literally sections in this bill that are acknowledging that jobs will be lost in this country if this bill is to pass. And in South Louisiana, they've got a large steel mill that has not decided what they're going to do yet very large company, it's going to make a $2 billion investment, 700 good jobs, high paying jobs. It's a steel mill that will be built somewhere in this world. And they haven't made any decision on what to do, in large part waiting to see what happens with this bill. And if cap and trade passes, they're going to go and build that plant in another country. And they're going to take that $2 billion of investment, and they're going to take those 700 jobs and send them to another country. The difference is, and it was pointed out again earlier, the carbon that would be emitted, if you really do feel that carbon is creating problems in this earth, the carbon that will be emitted in those other countries will be higher because they don't have the environmental standards that we have in this country today. So make no mistake about it, if this bill passes, there are already companies that are making contingency plans about taking jobs to other countries, taking billions of dollars of investment to other countries. That's right. Even in tough economic times, there are companies today ready to create new jobs, ready to invest billions of dollars. But they're going to be making those decisions based on policies that come out of Washington. And if Washington passes policies that don't allow them to compete in this country, they're still going to create those jobs, but they're going to create the jobs in other countries. And the real irony is, for people who feel that they're doing something to save the planet by passing legislation like this, it's actually going to be counterintuitive. 
because this legislation will run off jobs to other countries that emit more carbon for doing the exact same thing as done here in this country. And we've got a classic example of that right now in South Louisiana. So you want to create 700 good, high-paying jobs in the United States with $2 billion of private investment? Or do you want that money, those jobs, that investment going to another country? It literally, the fate of those types of jobs are literally going to be decided by the passage or failure of a cap-and-trade energy tax. And so make no mistake about it, there are high consequences. There are companies today, and maybe they're getting ready to take those free allowances. Maybe they've been negotiating in all these secretive meetings for the last few weeks to get these free allowances so that they can start planning their exit strategy. This buys them 10 years to slowly phase out of the United States. And don't think they're not going to do it because they're already sitting around talking about it. And so whether they're going to move their company out of this country later on after their free allowances run out, or they're just not going to make the investment and build the plant today in the United States, depending uh, on what happens to this bill. That's what's at stake. And so I support this would, amendment. Would the okay. gentleman Re yield? Reclaiming my I would, time. I would I, back Doyle, I think, I think no one on this side does not respect your sincerity. But I wanted Mr. Scalise to tell you right promptly that there is a clear case that a steel company, and you're talking about steel, is ready to move to Brazil. And I think he made the case very well. The other thing that you mentioned in your uh, speech was that the president will have the option in 2014 to practice protectionism, that he can go in and increase tariffs. You don't think businessmen and women in this country who are involved, who see this legislation coming down the line, are not going to wait? You think they're going to wait to 2014? They're going to make their steps early. And you're basically agreeing with the Rogers Amendment by saying, well, we agree with you, but we don't want to agree with you till 2014 when the president can exercise protectionism. And with that, let me yield uh, to Mr. Murphy, who's also from Pennsylvania. From Pennsylvania. I thank the gentleman. I, I do want to bring this up and remind the committee, as we have discussed this issue of China, how many hearings we have had on the China issue. So when it comes to trusting them, I'd just like to remind ourselves of how we don't. We've had hearings and discussed how they put lead paint in toys, a vinyl lunch boxes with lead, fungus contaminated food, reused chopsticks with unsafe color additives, baby bottles with ingredients that can alter a child's hormones, pacifiers with carcinogenic chemicals, teething toys with toxic chemicals, poison dog food. They violate copyrights on our music and recording. They send over inferior steel pipe, uh, fungus and diapers, counterfeit drugs. They've hacked into our computers, manipulated our currency, spied on our country, broken the laws of steel dumping, and now we trust them? I'd like to know where this came from. They also sell bombs to be used against our troops in Iraq. They've, um, and the president, who at one point campaigned on the point of Buy America, uh, said he opposed any measures of protectionism on the stimulus package. So I don't know where the new religion is coming from. We've, uh, we Gentlemen. also noticed that at a time when we did have tariffs on steel uh, dumping in this country, uh, that China continued to manipulate their currency, so even after the tariffs were taken off, we still ended up with other problems. So uh, I'm still concerned about you know, where China is suddenly coming through this metamorphosis. Gentleman's time is expired. Mr. Chairman. This, uh, uh, Ms. Shikowsky. Thank you. Some of us on this panel are old enough to remember when there was another young president years ago who promised the nation that we would be leaders and we would put a man on the moon in, in 10 years. He didn't say, well, we're going to do our best and maybe we'll get there and we'll try. He said, we will do that. And he triggered this incredible spirit of innovation in our country. Um, all kinds of, of people from students to entrepreneurs to researchers um, began that project not just to putting a man on the moon, but putting the United States of America back in a leadership position in innovation and technology. And it happened. What I see in this amendment is an innovation stopper. I feel the, the, the spirit of innovation crackling in my district. And I'm from Illinois, and we have lost jobs over, over the years. But over the break, I went to a place called ENC Electric in my district, which is developing the smart grid and actually expanding its work and finding customers overseas who want to buy their products. 
I hosted a nanotechnology roundtable with all these really smart young scientists and businesses that are looking for workers right now to, uh, to be able to, to carry, to, to bring their products to development and a sales force and, uh, and, and only wish that more of our students could be skilled in the, and, and these are not graduate or postgraduate degrees, I'm talking about junior college certificate students that could be working in these fields. We're going to be creating new markets in places like China and India people who want to buy our, our products. And, and I think that I, I want to associate myself with what uh, Representative Eshoo said, that we're betting on U.S. failure in the, in the field of innovation and leadership. And w this, this kind of amendment will put a stop to the direction that we're going in um, where we can succeed and be leaders again and have a cleaner environment. I'd be happy to yield. yield. I, I thank the gentle lady for yielding. You know, let's get, let's get real here for a second. There were 204,000 steel workers in 1990. There are 154,000 steel workers today. We're losing those jobs already. What Mr. Doyle has pointed out to you is that there's a program that begins in 2014, when this program begins, that goes all the way out to 2025 that protects the industry, the steel industry, the aluminum industry, the paper industry, the cement industry, so they can make this transition. And after that, the program begins to decline, but not at a very steep rate. But the president is left with the discretion uh, to put even tougher protection uh, uh, measures on the books. So let's deal in the real world here. We're trying to give these industries the transition period they need to become competitive. And the gentleman from Pennsylvania has been talking to the steel workers, talking to U.S. Steel, talking to them in terms of what they need. And I think that this, this side over here, if you want to engage in that kind of debate, apart from what's actually in the bill, what the industries that we're dealing with are already suffering from, the protections that we're building into the legislation so that they can have a transition to this new era, then you can continue that. But it's not dealing with the real world that Mike Doyle has presented to us in terms of the way in which this program is going to uh, actually operate. And I'd like, again, Mr. Doyle, if you would, to, to, to once again make that point, if you could, in terms of how vital this is to have a program to make that kind of a transition. We, we, we want to secure a future. The steel industry right now, uh, the, the general economy is down. Steel industry is in tough shape right now. And, and we want to make sure, as, as we look at these plants, and I still have two big operating mills in my district, Edgar Thompson Steelville and Mon, Mon Valley Works, uh, still employs lots of steel workers in my district. And, and we want to make sure that they just have a level playing field with their competitors. This bill does that. This bill does that for them for 10 years. They said the reason this doesn't start till 2014, by the way, is the caps don't go into effect till 2014. So we, we can't rebate costs that don't happen in, until the year when the program starts. So that, that's why the year 2014 was picked. Actually, prior to 2014, their indirect costs are, are rebated to them. So, so we've done everything we can. We've sat at the table with these stakeholders, and we said, you know, how do we make sure that you have a level playing field against your competitors? Uh, we've been working at it. There hasn't been, by the way, any secret meetings. Uh, all of you have been invited to be part of this. Uh, you were all invited to be part of, of helping to draft this bill, and any one of you could have been to any meetings that we had. So, so oh. this, this uh, has been yeah. right. and, and you had a chance to be a part of it. General so, ladies, time has expired. Who seeks recognition? I would ask unanimous consent that Ms. Shukowski have two additional minutes if she would yield for a question from me. Without objection, then the gentlelady has given two additional minutes. Would the gentlelady yield for a question? Let me, let, me, let me point out in response to what Mr. Doyle just said that I have been invited to participate in these talks. I'm, I can't speak for any other member, but I have been invited uh, by Mr. Doyle, Mr. Waxman, Ms. Mr. Markey, Mr. Dingle, Mr. Boucher, and since 
in order to participate, ha I had to agree to accept some version of cap and trade. I had to decline, but I was invited. I think I want to put that on the record. My, my question is to Mr. Doyle, number one, there's a 3% reduction from the 2005 baseline that's required in 2012. So what happens between now and 2014? The, the, uh, the, caps, the caps don't go into effect on these industries, the direct costs, their, their direct costs, until 2014. So but that's why the but, program starts. But what there. happens? In 2012 and 13, they get their indirect cost rebated. But, but there is a 3% reduction under the well, bill there, that's and, 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 and from 2014 to 2025, there's a 2% reduction of the total allocation pot. Well, somebody's so, got to reduce CO2 emissions below the 2005 limit by 3% in 2012. And right. some and, of those and, people are going to be in the steel industry and the aluminum and, industry. And by two, well, no, the industries too. That 2% that reduction applies to them also. Uh, it, starting in 2014, there's a 2% reduction in the total allocation pot. Nobody, nobody said that everybody isn't going to well, do my, their the, piece. The second part of my question is you get these allowances but the allowances are to emit CO2. There's, as I understand it, there's no protection against the electricity increase. The industry has to pay that. They don't have to pay for the allowances. That, that comes in a different section, Mr. Barton. Uh, we also look at, uh, in the electricity section, thir I believe it's 35 percent of the total allocation. Okay, well, we'll uh, come back. It is done. And so that, that is rebated back not only to residential, but also commercial customers. So there, there is relief given to the industry on their utility cost in addition to the relief we give them uh, because they have trade sensitivities and they're carbon intensive. Time so, has so expired. So they can fight out of both apples. Ms. Myrick. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I do identify with Mr. Upton's concerns, but I wanted to yield my time to Mr. Rogers, please. Thank you. Mr. Mark, Mr. Chairman, I, and, and to, to my good friends who have been talking about the word failure, I think we both want to get to the same place. But what this bill represents is saying that we believe that innovation in America has failed and will not work. So we're going to create a very large and complicated government-mandated scheme to help you out. I mean, it really points out that, that old notion that a camel was a horse uh, designed by a congressional committee. Because what we've got in here is a really a whole conglomerate of different ideas. And if you got lucky enough to get at the table and you got yourself and bought yourself your industries a little bit of time, hey, amen, great, good for you, brother. But the problem is auto parts people weren't there. Small manufacturers who do uh, uh, medical supply components for emergency rooms are looking at this, and they weren't there. I can give you industry after industry that didn't get to sit in that room and cut a special break. Because what every one of you have, has acknowledged is this bill will hurt manufacturing. You said it. We know it. We're going to try to help them. We're going to give them a little bit of money now knowing they've got money later. And here's my problem with my friend Mr. Doyle's uh, description. Even if they maintain that average, and I believe that you, you fervently believe this, but they have to, that pot gets smaller 2% every year. So what you're saying is, in order to stay average, you've got to shrink. We don't, when did we want our industries to get smaller? We want growth. I want more production. I want more people working. I'd love to get back to 200,000 jobs. Well, the gentleman but here it is. Here's how they have to do it. If they don't meet those standards, oh, yes, absolutely, it's in your bill. It's if they don't meet the standards, what they do is they go to Wall Street, and that's worked out well for us, hasn't it? Go to Wall Street and buy credits. So now I have a new cost in producing steel or auto parts or cars because we're growing. Somebody likes our product. Of course, now that's more expense. I've got to add that on. Jeremy, and here's, the, here's the problem. Let me finish my thought here if I can. Because this notion that somehow we're preaching failure and we don't believe in innovation is simply wrong. In the time that cap and trade was in Europe, and this is incredibly important, in the time that cap and trade was in Europe, they reduced their emissions 16%. In that same time frame, the United States, through innovation, not this bill, reduced it 20 percent. That's innovation. That's creativity. If we want to be for something, let's unleash innovative capability in America, not punish it. Because you know what? It's going to follow the money. So you know what they're going to do? They're going to go to Wall Street. 
They're going to figure out how these, these trades happen, and we're going to buy trades and credits, and we're going to go into brokerage houses. And millions and millions and millions of dollars that would have normally stayed in communities and employed people and provided health care benefits now flow through Washington, or Wall Street so that they can somehow allocate these things by a government formula that may or may not work for you. And if you're sitting at the table wondering, gee, am I going to keep my house next month? And you look at how complicated this thing is and how you clearly state that there are going to be job losses. It's in your own bill. And oh, by the way, in order to pay for those credits that we're going to give, those allocations, we're going to borrow more money from China. Fantastic. So we've just made it more interesting for a company to say, enough is enough. I'll go to China. Apparently, that's where the money is. My energy costs are less. My regulatory costs are less. Uh, and that's why people are going to go, not to get away from compliance here on, 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 on pollutants. They're going because their electricity bill is a lot less. So now we've got to pay $3,100 and try to figure out a way to help poor people meet that $3,100. We know it's going to cost the average American family. Now we have an increased electric costs to the co companies, and our only solution is we're going to allow you to have these allocations that will get smaller in your, in your out years of production. So you either figure it out or you go to Wall Street and buy credits. That does not seem like a logical plan to me to help the environment or help employment. So I understand where you're going, but this is big and it's complicated, and we don't do big and we don't do complicated very well in the United States when it comes to the federal government. Will the gentleman yield? I will yield. A actually. Output-based rebates actually encourage more production, not encourage them to produce less. Uh, our industries here in the United States, uh, are in the steel industry, we're producing a ton of steel, uh, much less, much below what the average sector is. So, so this, this for a lot of companies in the United States is, is there's going to be an incentive for, for, for more production. Uh, but but you're al if I'm reclaiming my time, your allocations are going to continue. Otherwise, this doesn't work, right? Your plan doesn't work if the allocations doesn't get smaller. That's well, the, the whole notion of it. So if they continue to produce and win, win contracts and win jobs, eventually they're going to have to go to Wall Street to buy credits, which increases their costs, which is my whole point. And the two times that we have mandated things, we mandated that homeowners had to, buy, had to get loans that they couldn't afford. They lost those homes, and we all almost lost ours. And we mandated that car companies had to build cars even if they weren't making money at it. So now what we're going to do, and guess you can see what's happening in the car industry, now we're going to do it again, only we're going to do it to everybody. And so our argument is, be careful what you're doing. Let innovation work. Believe in America. It's working. It already worked. No, it Gentlemen's time has expired. We're, uh, we're, we're starting some votes on the floor. Let me suggest, if this would meet the approval of the members of the committee, that we yield uh, two minutes uh, on the Republican side, two minutes on the Democratic side, then have the previous question, and we will vote after the votes. Come back, because I think if we had a roll call vote, I don't think there's. I think there's a lot of members, Mr. Chair. Are there a lot of members who wish to vote? Okay, well, let's continue. Uh, the debate now goes to the Democratic side of the aisle. If not, who seeks recognition? Gentleman from Kentucky, recognized for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much, and I would like to congratulate the gentleman from Pennsylvania and others who, uh, for protecting the steel industries and some other industries in this bill, and it's important that they do that. I might add it would not be necessary to protect those industries were we not trying to implement a cap and trade system and a renewable mandate. But the problem that many of us have on this side of the aisle is that in this legislation we are clearly picking winners and losers in the economy. What about those areas of the country that do not have a lot of iron and steel and aluminum? Who's going to protect them? How are they going to be protected? We know that this bill provides all sorts of subsidies for particular industries like wind and solar. But what about more traditional industries that are trying to compete? And I've heard a lot of talk today, and Hell, there's 10 billion bucks. I have no problem with it. The, obviously, the, we want the United States to be a leader. We want the United States to be a leader in protecting the environment. But I would add and remind everyone that Europe was the leader on cap and trade. They were out there first with cap and trade. And they testified here that they actually were producing more carbon dioxide emissions 
than before they adopted a cap-and-trade system. And I might add that if you read The Economist, and I'm sure most of you do, over the last five or six years, you will notice that the unemployment rate in Europe has been higher than almost any other uh, sector uh, or geographical area in the, in, in the world, uh, with the exception of some underdeveloped countries. And uh, so the concern that we have is, and, and we've, we remember the Chinese who uh, we met with, and, and they did indicate, yes, we're bringing on one new coal-powered plant every two weeks. Uh, I think Fred said one, but uh, the ones that I talked to said every two weeks. And they also said we're not using scrubbers and we're not using carbon capture and sequestration. And the reason that we are doing it is because we already have low labor cost and now we, we, we want our electricity cost to be lower than in America. And it's great for America to be a leader, but we want to be competitive in the global marketplace. And I, that's why I think this amendment of Mr. Rogers is worth uh, yeah, adopting, up. because if we go to Copenhagen, and if we exert the, I mean, our president is a quite uh, popular fellow, and he's remarkably persuasive. And if he goes to Copenhagen and can persuade them to adopt similar standards that we're adopting here in America, great. Then this am amendment wouldn't even be necessary. But to protect the American worker, we know that there's going to be a lot of, of, of job loss. We, everyone recognizes that. Uh, e even uh, in the president's budget, he had something like $657 billion over 10 years from cap and trade. And when Peter Orzag came to testify before Congress, he said it may be double that or three times that. But we know electrical costs are going to go up. And so I think the bottom line is we're competing in the global marketplace. And in order to do that, we have to have low electricity cost. And <clears throat> that's why I think this amendment is very important, because it simply provides a level playing field for American employees. Now, this is more than about American leadership. This is also protecting the jobs of the American people. And I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back the balance of his time. Who else seeks recognition? Mr. Mr. Walden. Mr. Chairman, move to strike the last word. Gentleman is recognized for Mr. Five. Chairman, we'll come to this side at all? We'll come back. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, I've heard a lot today about uh, protecting this specific industry or that specific industry. And I find that I understand why people are moving in that direction because of the onerous effect this bill will have on those industries if they're not protected. And that's, uh, I think, what my colleague from Kentucky, Mr. Whitfield, was saying. You know, it's kind of interesting if you go back and look at the testimony of uh, Peter Orzog, then CBO director. He's now President Obama's uh, head of the Office of Management and Budget. He said if you didn't auction the permits, it would represent the largest corporate welfare program that has ever been enacted in the history of the United States. All of the evidence suggests that what would occur is that corporate profits would increase by approximately the value of the permits. And so what's happening in this bill is those who had an inside track or an effective argument or a big advocate are now getting these um, permits for free. And so it's going to them at no charge, but that's to protect them from the damage that would otherwise be done to them by enactment of these provisions. But over time, as I understand it, uh, those allocations bleed away. It reminds me, a colleague of mine said about this whole notion, he said, it's a bit like swallowing a tapeworm. It doesn't affect you at first, but it begins to eat you alive later. And so I think that's a real graphic uh, explanation. Now, the other thing that happens when you represent a rural agricultural district like I do, there's always this talk about we're going to put tariffs on, and by golly, we're going to protect this industry, steel or aluminum or whatever's favored at the moment by Washington. And then these countries aren't operating out there in a vacuum. They have the ability to come back if those tariffs or penalties or whatever Congress decides to enact uh, don't meet up with uh, our world trade agreements, and usually they don't. Then they come back and they don't slam necessarily steel or aluminum. They they get the choice to pick other items. 
And this Congress already under Democrat leadership in uh, one of the bills that passed uh, decided to get into a little tariff war, a little trade war with Mexico over trucks to protect uh, American trucking system, allegedly. So that violated NAFTA. And Mexico had the right then to come back and start enacting tariffs. And they are. Up to 20 percent tariffs on pears and cherries and onions and potatoes and Christmas trees and various other project, products they decided, Mexico decided, under their rights, under the treaties we have, to come after us. And so I'd like to ask counsel, can you show me in here what the tariffs are in this bill? Where? Point the gentleman would yield to me. Yes, sir. There are no tariffs in this bill. Okay, then let me ask you this, because, Mr. Chairman, I thought I heard earlier Ways and Means was going to put some sort of protectionist. Uh, they, they, tariff. May, they may well put in a uh, border tariff to help those industries that might face unfair competition. But I'd ask the gentleman who backs free trade, do you think that has had any result in jobs going overseas? I would, I would submit free that that's been the... the sucking sound that we've seen from well reclaiming my time mis reclaiming my time gone. mr chairman certainly in trade agreements there are those who do better and those who don't i stipulate that but i also would tell you on the face of it that when you dramatically increase energy costs on the remaining american manufacturers and you have the head of the national Ma association of manufacturers testify that this bill alone will cost 2 million to 3 million american manufacturing jobs that that is not an inconsequential piece of legislation. And so I, I'm trying to figure out, I haven't had time to get through all 930 however many pages, so let me ask the council this. Where is it in here where the allocations are to specific industries? Can you, can you tell me where that is? Because I've heard that they're somehow protected for certain years, and I'd like to know how many credits they're getting when they get them. The and gentleman will yield to me on that yes, as yes. well. That's in Title IV of the Act. We're not at that point yet. Well, but we're certainly debating here now over well, I Mr. Refer Rogers' to Title IV. amendment. Answer your question. And, and that's why I, I was curious, because I've heard in the debate that, that those industries are cared for well in this bill. So does the council direct me to what page that's on? Council, do you know what page Title IV starts? Just one moment. Once we answer that question, we're going to break for a vote. And in fact, there will be three votes, uh, which give members uh, uh, notice, no, and that uh, we'll come back after the three votes okay. continue. I, I'm told it's Title III, Mr. Chairman, by our staff, maybe page 553. Greg, is it four? Greg? Section 782. <laughs> Page 736, maybe? So what's the... Page 733 in Title IV. That's the rebate program. And then the allocation, though, program is Title III, I believe. You may well be right. Do you, do you want, should we wait for an answer until after we vote? Uh, if, if you would like, we can, we'll Did vote them and uh, we'll have the answer for you upon your return. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks. The committee stands in recess until after the votes on the House floor.
You're on C-SPAN 3. You're watching live coverage of a meeting of the House Energy and Commerce Committee. This is the second day that they're working on energy and climate change legislation written by the committee's Democrats. A, a full day of markup here on C-SPAN 3, and our live coverage will continue. A uh, break now to allow members of the committee to go to the House floor for a series of votes. While we wait for the uh, markup meeting to uh, resume here on C-SPAN 3, a Pentagon briefing from today. Topics at the Defense Department briefing include new humanitarian aid to Pakistan, 